Right, our next speaker is Jeremy Bennett. Uh, Jeremy's chair of the Open Source Specialist Group, Chief Executive M. M. Bacosum and Vice Chair of the MBench M Task Group. And his talk is going to be on evaluating Risk 5 using the MBench 0.5 benchmark suite. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm presenting this talk on behalf of the whole group. Um, um, I've named the core four members um, who kicked off the work, but it's now a much bigger member. One of the other people who's made a big contribution is John Taylor, who certainly earlier on was on the actual uh, go-to webinar call. Um, although it was initiated by Dave Patterson, it's actually wider than Risk Five. It just happens he he was also involved with Risk Five. Um, and I want to just introduce you to MBench and then take you through a few things it can tell you about Risk Five and why benchmarking matters if you want to develop a processor and the software ecosystem around it. And this really brings together three previous talks, my talk at FOSDEM last year um, and the talks that David and I gave at the Risk Five Summit um, last month. So what we wanted to do was to come up with a better suite, suite of programs for benchmark, a better way of benchmarking computers. And whenever you want to do something new, a good plan is to look at what went before to see what they can tell you. And so we looked at the history of uh, benchmarking systems. And you can go back to some very old ones, LINPAC, which is what's used to define the performance of supercomputers. It's what the top 500 is based on. Um, it's a single program. And if you're very good at computation and don't have to worry about processor communication, you will do really well on a supercomputer. It's, it's wonderful for showing off your million core um, supercomputer, but it is terribly stylized. It has virtually no inter-process communication, so it parallelizes wonderfully. Um, it's not a good test of whether you've got your communication backplane right. Dry stone, that comes from uh, a very early paper by Reinhold Weicker in 1984. And before it, there was Knut's paper, Whetstone, which is where dry stone gets its mark. And it was the idea of having a synthetic benchmark. It's not a real program. It has all the features of real programs as used in system programming. Okay, so now we have a single program that's good for evaluating for system programs. Um, and then you go on a bit and you get to 1989 and you come up with SPEC. And SPEC is um, a set of programs for evaluating computers, particularly those that are going to be used as servers. And interestingly, you look at it and you see it's a bit different. It's not a single program. It's a varying number of programs. Over the years, it's changed from 10 to 23. And the reason it changes is there's a new version of spec every three years or so. It learns and improves. Okay? And it has a high reputation for quality. And it's interesting. How does it bring together a whole load of benchmarks and average them out? And a simple average won't do because you tend to get dominated by the biggest program or the fastest program. So they used the idea of using a geometric mean, which has a, a property of pulling in outreaches. And it also didn't measure absolute values. It took a baseline figure and measured how you performed relative to that value, which also tends to even out extremes. And Interestingly, the first two benchmarks came out purely as university research. This was a collaboration between universities and industry. So some good things to bring out of there. The downside of all that collaboration is it involved people working and it wasn't free, which the first two. You can run Limpact, you can run Drystone, a free event. You get Cormark coming out of that in 2009 as a free benchmark. So it's one program only, but it comes out of that spec mark stable and it has the advantage of being free, but it's a single program. It's never been updated. 
it's suitable for embedded world and it's more an academic exercise. And then let's look to something much more recent, an MLPerf. How many people here have heard of MLPerf? Right, so a couple of people working in the AI field. It's an attempt to come up with a performance benchmark suite for the machine learning AI world, and it's aimed at machine learning service. Okay, it's got a low reputation because it's new. You can only get a reputation after time, high reputation after time. It's planned to be revised every year. It's still in its first version. It's more than one program, so it's learned from spec. It's seven programs, and it uses as its summary score ratios like SpecMark. It uses a geometric mean, and it introduces the idea of a geometric standard deviation. So you can see not what just what the average performance is, but what the variance is. Okay, and again, it's a collaboration between academia, as it happens, Dave Patterson again, and industry um, with your favourite big well-known multinationals being in there, Google amongst them. So there's a bit of history there of what works and what doesn't. And there are some less well-known benchmark suites, Embassy, the embedded um, um, microprocessor benchmarking consortium. That's uh, an industry consortium aimed to do the spec sort of thing, but for the embedded world. Quality reputation, Hard to gauge. There are lots of people who think it's very good, others who are frustrated that because it costs money, it's hard to get hold of. I think if you're part of the consortium of companies that came together to create it, it's good. It, do, it does revise, but not terribly frequently. It has a lot of programs, that's very good. And it has an organization behind it, the Embassy Consortium, formed of big companies. And basically, it's a club of companies. It only comes out of industry. Okay? And it doesn't have a summary score. It's a set of programs each individually tell you something. And then some others. MyBench, one of the earliest of the well-known uh, open source benchmark suites, aimed at embedded. Um, no one's really established what its quality reputation is. It's free. It's easy to port. It's never been changed since it was first done. 36 programs. No organization supporting it, no summary score. It's purely academic exercise, but it's quite widely used. Interestingly, Beebs, and I put my hand up because I was the man behind Beebs, 2013, funded out by Innovate UK as part of research projects, a research project into using compilers for energy efficiency. We needed to measure how good they were. We wanted a good, reliable benchmark suite for embedded systems suitable for measuring energy. Okay. Um, Quality reputation, it's used. We don't know whether it's not been widely enough used yet to establish its reputation. It's free, it's easy to port. It's update, been updated every couple of years. Okay, so we're, we're, we're sort of on its third generation now. It's big, it's got 80 programs in it. Okay, it has no organization beyond the fact that my company was behind it, so we tend to do anything with it. It doesn't have a summary score. It was never intended to give you a magic figure. It was to be used as a set of programs for evaluating energy behavior. And interestingly, it's a cooperation between Embercosm, a company, and Bristol University, an academic institution. So again, the academia industry <coughs> combination. And then recently, um, there's been Tacklebench come out, uh, 2016, looking at worst case execution times, which is a hot topic of interest. Can you predict worst case execution? Quite new. Reputation not that clear. To be honest, I work in this field and I haven't come across it until last year. Okay. It's free, it's easy to port, it's never been revised. It's also reasonably big, 52 programs, and it's pure academic. So we're taking out of here in green some themes. It needs to be free so it gets used, it needs to have an organization to maintain it. It works best if it's a collaboration with academia and industry, and you need more than one program. And here we summarize up those lessons. So, so it must be free, must be easy to use. If it's impossible to use, and that's one of the problems with Beeps, it's not that easy to port and run. It's a problem. It must be real programs. What becomes clear is if you do synthetic benchmarks, they're inherently quite small because they're quite hard to write. And you learn about them, and then your compilers and your platforms are good at running this one synthetic benchmark, which isn't a real program. Use real programs so you get the breadth of life there. And these things die if they don't have an organization to support it. 
And people still need a magic number. People code dry stone scores. Dry stone, going back to 1984, they quote core mark scores going back um, a decade. And people just want a magic number so they can summarize their knowledge. Okay. Geometric mean and standard deviation are the way to do summarizing to avoid outliers, and you do that relative to a baseline, not as absolute figures to further level. And we need it to involve both academia and industry. And if you look at the names we had there, there's one academic, uh, Dave Patterson, and the three industrialists, Palmer de Belt, Jeremy Bennett, and Cesare Galati. And since then, we've been joined by a mixture of people. We have a number of academics involved. We have a number of industry people involved across the industry. So we have ARM involved, uh, for example. So, the, the four names, there's four of us met for six months, meeting monthly, to try and get a first version. We decided to base uh, mBench on Beebs, and Beebs itself is a collection of programs for things like MyBench and the Worst Case Execution uh, Task Force and so forth. So, like all good open source, it's made by building with what went before. But 80 programs was just too much to maintain, and some of them were of questionable value in a benchmark suite. So, we aimed to tune it down and get a representative set, okay? And the idea was to work for six months in a small team so we could get something, rather than saying, hey, here's a good idea, and turn into a giant work talking shop, is to have a starting point. And then in June last year, we announced it at the European Risk 5 meeting, and we opened it up for wider participation. So we have a mailing list with uh, uh, tens of people on it, and we have a monthly call, and I think we had about a dozen people on the call earlier today. Um, anyone can join, anyone can join the monthly call, it's completely free. If you go to mbench.org, uh, you can join there. We are a self-referential organization group, but we sit under the Free and Open Source Silicon Foundation. So we're technically a committee of the Free and Open Source Silicon Foundation. Um, that gives us a host for our website. The group is chaired by Dave Patterson, I'm the vice chair. Okay. We have a target. and. The reason I and my colleague Paolo Savini, who's sitting in the front chair there, are looking slightly bleary-eyed is we are trying to make sure that all the loose ends are tied up in time for the big launch at Embedded World. And then we'll do, then the, 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 the program will live on. Okay? So we tried not to boil the ocean. We thought, let's try and solve the easiest problem first. So we focused initial, the initial version of mBench, mBench IoT, is aimed at the small IoT class device. So 64K of ROM, 64K RAM max, really 64 in total is sufficient. We've got 19 benchmarks. We'd really have liked to have something that got elliptic curve DSA in there. We'd have really liked to have something that picked up Bluetooth NE as well, but we weren't able to do that. The other thing is it's not just about compute. There is an aspect to mBench which is actually a little bit behind, but which Cesare Garlatti has been driving is, we want to benchmark context switching interrupt handling. There is in the repository, a separate repository for this as a prototype thing. We don't believe this can be done generically in a high level language. It's too intimately tied to the processor. What we believe we can do is come up with a set of rules that tell you how to port this assembler program to a new architecture so you can get meaningful data to evaluate platforms on their context hand switching and their interrupt handling. At this stage, um, in order to make it easy to use, we've got some Python scripts to build and benchmark. Okay, that works well for building programs across a wide range of architecture, works well for benchmarking code size. The current stress and gray hairs are caused by getting this to work reliably for evaluating performance. Remember, these are IoT class devices. They don't generally have a keyboard and monitor attached. So you have to find a way to extract performance data out of them when they've got very little uniform I.O. Mostly tested with simulators so far, we are working on being able to run this on real hardware because that's the ultimate proof of, of the system. We've done work with RISC-V. We've done a lot of work with actually with ARM um, uh, we've done work with the ARC EM processor. We've actually compared it with the Atmel AVR uh, uh, ATX Mega architecture as well to look at how an 8-bit processor would work because they're, they're still used. Okay. 
and we want to widen it further. It's free, it's open, please contribute. Okay, we have one contributor, Ola Jepson, has contributed a patch to allow you to run this native. So this isn't really the sort of size program you're going to use to evaluate an x86, but it's a useful to be able to run them on x86 and just check everything's working. Okay, so here, here's the baseline data. Um, these slides will be available afterwards. Uh, those are the 19 programs. We're covering things like Monte Carlo, um, a Montgomery multiplication, sorry, various crypto things, various statistic things, um, networking things, and so forth. And they come from a whole load of different backgrounds. You can see quite a few from my bench and uh, worst case execution, one from um, uh, AHA. Um, and for each of them, we've measured how much C code there is. And you can see they're small. The biggest ones are a small number of thousand lines of code. The smallest ones, there's we've got one program UD, which is very useful, which is just under 100 lines of C code. So they're really more program kernels. They're real programs, but they're very small. And the reason is the size of architecture we're on. Okay. And we know their code size. We know their code size, as in the .text section. We know that what that is in bytes. And you can see the biggest one's 15K, and the smallest one is, what, a couple of hundred bytes. Okay. And we know how much data they use. And there's a big question of what are you measuring? Are you looking at code size? Are you looking at read-only data as well, because that has to go in ROM? Are you looking at writable data that's initialized, because that has to go in ROM with its initial values? What about BSS, which doesn't have to be initialized, but you still have to provide RAM for it? And you'll also look at, we try to analyze these programs to make sure there's a good mix. And this is something that comes out of Beebs. Beebs did this. Um, so we look at, is this a very branchy program? Is it a very memory intensive program? Is it very ALU compute intensive? And you can see we've got a mix. Some are good in one end and low in another. That comes out of a desire to be able to do good statistical analysis, gain good variability across the programs. So we've got a whole set of baseline data. So now what do we do with that? Oh, there's a public repository. So if you go to um, mbench.org, the main website, it will point you at the repositories. And there are three repositories. There's the mbench IoT, which is these benchmarks. There's the mbench um, uh, context switching benchmark, has its own repository. And there's an mbench results repository. Use that one with caution. It's still a proof of concept. But ultimately, the idea is you'll be able to do a pull request with your results. And we'll have them there. And we are certainly talking to organizations that are well established about actually having independent organizations so you can push results and then have someone else who's trusted say we have validated these results, we believe them. Okay. So what affects results? What can benchmarking tell you? Well, what instruction set you use can affect your speed, can affect your code size. What compiler you use, either GCC or LLVM or one of the proprietary ones. Why is Endocosm listed as proprietary? That's a typo. Um, I can't remember. I, we are most certainly not proprietary. We're an open source company. IAI uh, is the best known of the proprietary ones. Which optimizations are included? You know, are you doing loop unrolling? Are you doing inlining? Which can make you go fast, but very big. And it's worth bearing in mind that the compilers mature over time. So you might expect the compiler to have more of an effect on something like ARM, which has been around for a long time, and perhaps RISC V, which is pretty new. And don't forget the effect of libraries. Even in the embedded world, you're going to link in libraries. If you're running on a, an integer system, something's going to emulate floating point. Something, your 8-bit system, something's going to em, emulate long double. Um, so so um, there, and of course, you may be putting in those, some of those can be free and open, like new lib and so forth uh, for C library, but there, people like IAR and indeed have, have uh, others have their own libraries that are highly optimized for efficiency. And in fact, mbench excludes libraries when sizing, typically, and that's still under review. Because it's not finally done that we've actually got that right. And the reason is, as I'll show later, when you have a small program, if you link in the libraries, they can make it very big, and you just keep on measuring the size of the library again and again and again, just keep on linking it in. So let's have a look. So let's have a look at the environment. I'm going to focus on code size for two reasons. One is for a deeply embedded system, typically code size matters. Secondly, the, I've got less data on run times because that's the area we're still working on. So I've compared four architectures, AVR, ATX, Mega, 
the ARC EM, that's our embedded architecture. One of the problems we have a problem with the compiler. So take the ARC results with a very big pinch of salt because we're not using the compressed instructions. Unlike RISC V, where we're using the IMC, so that's got the baseline integer, the multiply operations, and the compressed instructions. And we're using the save restore optimization in the compiler for efficient entry and exit functions. And for ARM, we're using Cortex M4 and its integer configuration, but with the thumb for V2 compressed instructions. So that's why it's not fair on ARC, because RISC V and ARM are using compressed instructions. And ARC, which has very good compressed instructions, is not. On some early work I've done with ARC, I would expect ARC actually to be the one that does best on code size overall. Okay, so we can see the architecture makes a big difference. And AVR being an 8 bit architecture, ultimately that costs, okay, because everything takes so many instructions to do something if it's at all big. Okay, code size of architecture varies. So I've just looked at RISC V because this talk is about how you can analyze RISC V. So, Let's look at the baseline RV32I, okay, and we're looking at that basic code size variant. So you see these figures are all about one. I've got a baseline set of data. It happens to be the code size of RV32IC, okay, which you can see is uh, sorry, the IMC, so the one, one before the right. That was originally defined to be 1.0. The reason it isn't 1.0 is the original baseline was done with GCC9. And we're now on GCC 10, which has actually slightly improved things. So we start RV32I, no compressed instructions. That has a score of 1.4. There is a version of RV32 designed for very small silicon, which has um, uh, a reduced set of its stretches. That's called the RV32E baseline. Okay? Because you've got fewer registers, the code tends to be bigger. You have to do more register spilling. Then we come to RV32IC, that's where we put the compressed instructions in, and we get down to, with GCC10, it now matches our original baseline. If we look at the compressed instructions with the RV32E baseline, that's a bit bigger. So you've got fewer registers, less silicon for your processor, but your program's going to be bigger. If we look at, we put the multiply instructions in, well, we do better than RV32I slightly because multipliers are going to be slightly more efficient. And when we mix IM and add the compressed instructions in, then actually we get to our best code size, which is 0.98. These are all you compile with the same option, they're just changing the architecture. There is something experimental, um, which is the bit manipulation instruction extension. That's not yet approved, but we've actually done a version of GCC that supports it. And that doesn't make any difference to the code size, but I will come back to that because you may notice on each of these ones, I've shown you the error bars. These are the geometric standard deviation above and below. And what you will notice there is that though RV32 IMC and RV32 IMCB have the same geometric mean result, there is more variability in the bit manipulation. So some things it does better and some things it does worse. And we'll look at that in a bit more detail later. What about compiler optimizations? I've looked at code size here, and O0 is terrible. It's terrible on performance, it's terrible on code size. Yeah, don't use it. Um, OS, optimized for size, which is basically OS in GCC means optimize the code for speed, but leave out ones which tend to make size worse. So you get a reasonably fast program and a considerably smaller program. One of the things that Risk five does not do well compared to say ARM is it doesn't have a multi multi register save and restore, which is typically what you need to do at the start and end of a function. So there is an optimization for uh, GCC where there are small library functions that actually do save a load of registers, store a load of registers. So when you go into a function, you call these functions to do your saving of your registers onto the stack. When you return, you call it to restore them, and that's much more smaller than actually one at a time saving and restoring each of the registers. That optimization has been in fairly recently. My colleagues worked on it. When you get that, we get that's where we get the baseline score of point one, we get a score of point nine eight. All of these are using RB32 IMC uh, all, the, all, all the way through. There is a technique called combined elimination. It's an example, it's a, it's a simplified form of iterative compilation where we try all the possible small detailed optimization flags 
So we say go away, and it comes out with about 25 flags you can use. And if you use that, it will save you another couple of points on the average. Uh, do better with some than with others. And that's a good example of the sort of modern compiling techniques that can prove that. There are other optimization techniques I haven't looked at, in particular link time optimization that can go even further. Then when we look at the speed optimizations, we see they start to have a detrimental effect. So minus 01, your code will go reasonably quickly, but the code's a bit bigger. Minus 02, a bit quicker, a bit bigger. Minus 03, quite a lot bigger and a bit quicker. Let's turn on a fair amount of inlining. Actually, it doesn't make difference, much difference to the code size, but your code will go faster. When you unleash everything, you say unroll all the functions, inline any way you can, the code size goes through the roof, three times as big, but your code does go a bit quicker. And you can see the error bar has gone off the scale because actually for some programs, all that unrolling and inlining makes them absolutely massive. And for others, it doesn't. So this is the value of error bars. When you see a big error bar, it says, there's big wins sometimes and there are big losses other times. So we can see the compiler. So we've seen two things. The architecture has an impact on code size. The compiler has an impact. And something I want to show you here is about, I talked about maturity of the compiler. Here is the score for ARM Cortex-M4 and uh, RV32IMC. I'm using the, the Core 5 and the SD Core. Um, and what we see is, if we look at that arm using the OS, the Thumb 2, and so forth, you see that over the past six years, since 4.9.4 GCC, they've got a 1% improvement in compiled code size. And that's what you'd expect. They've had well, half a dozen really top GCC engineers working on this stuff for more than a decade. They're really good people. Their compiler ought to be jolly good, and there shouldn't be much room for more improvement. RIS-5 GCC, on the, on the other hand, is much newer, okay? And you'll see that it had a score of 1.02 three, three years ago. It's slightly improved, 1.01, and then it stayed stable at 1.01. In the last year, between the release of 9.2, which is the latest release compiler, and the work in progress, which is 10.0, that will become 10.1 in a month or two's time, you'll see there's actually been a bit of a step we start improving. What is different there? That's when Western Digital placed a contract with my company, as it happens, and started putting a big team in themselves to start working seriously on code size of Risk Five, and that has led to a big improvement. But one of the weaknesses of Risk Five, which everyone will accept and few will do about, is that Arms put half a dozen people on their compiler team who are really good for a decade. It's no good making a brilliant processor if you do not invest in the tools as well. And risk five across the board, not just the compiler, is under-investing in software. Okay. You need to invest a lot of money in software. That shows. So it's showing there's hope. It's showing ARM is still well ahead. Okay. But risk five is improving. Will risk five catch up? Um, I think that it will get better. I think ARM will probably keep its nose in head because I think. Actually, the ARM Thumb 2 instruction set, which of course is a second generation compressed instruction set, is probably slightly better than RISC-V's compressed instruction set in terms of what programmers need. Um, the bit manipulation extensions actually may fill that gap. So you may see RV32 IMCB gets to the stage where it is comparable with ARM. And ARC, as I say, when you've got the compressed instruction, I would expect ARC to be slightly better still. Okay, I mentioned three areas where I think the architecture affects it, the compiler affects it, libraries affect it. Let's compare ARM against RISC V. We'll just compile programs, compare their size. We've both compiled their compressed instructions minus OS. And look at that. ARM scores 1.9, RISC V 1.0. RISC V is brilliant. Okay. This is actually earlier work. It's done with Beebs, which is the originator before mbench. I haven't really reproduced this with mbench, but the results would be very similar because it's a subset of the enterprise. And I've arbitrarily chosen this as 1.0. Okay, this is a, a different baseline. I've just said, let's take my baseline. Whatever the size of Beebs was, geometric mean, for um, uh, compiling programs with minus OS, that's the baseline. And ARM by comparison is 1.91. 
So clearly, risk five is a much more compressed instruction set than R, except it isn't. Because let's get rid of the C runtime startup. The C runtime startup for risk five is tiny. It sets up the stack pointer and away you go. The C runtime startup out of the box for ARM deals with all sorts of wondrous things to do with are you embedded C and you need to initialize constructors and so forth. So whereas the CRT0, the C runtime startup for risk five is what, tens, a few hundred bytes, it's 4K for ARM. These programs are small. If I'm going to put a 4K load on top of all those tiny little programs, it's going to dominate. Take that off, yes. Wouldn't the, the need for constructors uh, you know, initialization be there for risk five too, if you're using C++? It, it would, exactly. Um, in deeply embedded, you tend not to use C++ because it's right. too big, but um, it would do. What I'm saying is that actually, in a deeply embedded system, typically you probably own C runtime startup anyway. So the standard distributed new lib CRT0, which is really for I want to use new lib under a Linux environment anyway, um, is completely inappropriate. So for risk five, I probably need something more complex for ARM. Any real product, it'd be something much simpler. Let's take that out of the equation because it's just a load. And now ARM is slightly better than risk five. Okay. And it turns out, what about the C library? Okay. Now, actually, mBench deliberately tries to avoid using the C library because we want to measure the benchmark. We don't want to measure the library. But ARM has a rather more efficiently implemented C library. So actually, even though we only use a little bit, if you take the C library off, ARM gets better and better. And ARM actually also has an optimized emulation library for things you don't necessarily have the floating point support. Now, mbench IoT has not got much floating point in it, but it does have a bit. So actually, if you take off libgcc, ARM still stays better. And lastly, the math library, ARM has quite a good math. It doesn't make much difference, um, but taking off the math library. So that's the reason for mbench. We measure with all the code size. We need to compile with the code size flag and check it works. So we need to run it, you need the libraries to make it work. You, you know, this code isn't there for ornamentation, it does stuff. So we need to check that the code is functional, but once the code is functional, at the moment we then measure it with all the libraries off. Now how you do that is a bit of an open question because it's clearly not the same program. Is there a better way of eliminating arbitrary overhead of libraries without having to recompile to make a program that it of itself cannot execute. So this is, uh, why, why is this different from just measuring the object file? Because if I've used link time optimization, I want to see the optimization that goes across the object files. So if you do LTO, I can measure all the individual object files and they're this big, and then I do global inter-procedure optimization across all the object files and it goes down this big. It's a really hard problem because actually if I LTO across the libraries, that's going to have an effect. I don't know what the answer is. There are lots of debates. I don't think there's a clear, easy winner. Please join the discussion, give your opinions. Um, I think we're moving away from quite such a black and white approach here because there's a feeling there's a lack of credibility on a benchmark you cannot actually execute. So we may look at see if there are other ways. Why do I not just measure the size of the library? The answer is I compile with garbage collection of sections. So how much library I add in varies from program to program. Um, now, the nice thing for my program, I, I appreciate everyone wants a single figure and it's great, but I like looking at the detail because that gives you lots. So let's compile all 19 programs and compare the sizes between um, risk five and ARM. And you can see there are quite a few where ARM actually has a smaller program, but there are some like statemate which ARM has a bigger program. Um, that's not that's the order, that's the alphabetical order list of programs. If I order them by the difference, I can see I've got some programs down this end where ARM is much smaller than RISC V, which is code size, so small is good. So you start to see ah, Nepal, that, that's a crypto program. Nepal AES. That's a crypto program. ARM turns out to actually know a thing or two about instructions you need for cryptography. So it does quite well on those. Once it do well on cubic, actually ARM has better support for long, long 
which risk five doesn't support in its ABI, so it's a pain in the neck. Conversely, there are things up here where risk five actually does better, and those are still open. What is it that risk five gets right in those ones? That's a good one for the compiler engineer and the architecture designer to go away and look at and say, why does risk five do so well there? What can we make? Here's another one here. I told you about the bit manipulation extension. Well, we've done a GCC for that, which supported the bit manipulation extension. And the average came out the same. But here's the interesting thing. It's a very early version of the compiler. It only has one or two optimization patterns in it. It doesn't look at all the places you could use the bit manipulation instruction. And what it turns out is it's a bit rough. And on average, it tends to make the code a bit bigger except for something where one of the patterns hits, and it happens to hit in the SHA-256 hash, and the optimizer suddenly sees a pattern, it uses bit manipulation, and suddenly we get a huge improvement in code size there. And the clue was there, not in the average, but the standard deviation, and that's why you need to look in detail. Yes, Andy? With OS, why does it make it bigger sometimes? Why doesn't it just leave those optimizations off? Uh, because, um, that's a good question, Paolo. You wrote this yes. compiler. Oh, no, you did the LLVM one. You did the LLVM. Yes. This is GCC. Hmm. I might guess it's about uh, introduction, other instruction, but recognition. Yes, I think the problem not... is these, some of these are heuristic. Yeah. Okay, so the heuristics probably aren't well enough tuned yet. Remember, this is a project over the summer to support the standard. I, we have this interesting thing where the rules for standardization and extension in risk five say you must have full compiler support and where the compiler community says we will not allow a compiler extension upstream until the extension has been ratified these two are clearly in conflict and that needs sorting out but this was to at least get part of the way and say even if it's not upstream we can do a compiler for this and prove it works okay but this is the point i want to make is look at the detail Look at the detail. What does it tell you? What is it we're getting right here and perhaps getting a bit wrong there? And I could have done the same ordering as I did before to see what do we do well with bit the nip and what do we do badly. Okay. So, in summary, we've got 19 programs. It's reasonably easy to port and bring up, focusing initially on IoT class embedded processors. We see next steps as a set of suites that handle people who've got floating point in there because there's no flow. We've taken all the floating point ones out of these. Um, the use of geometric mean and relative scoring and the use of standard deviation so you can see when things are varying a lot. We've got a sustained industry academia organization chaired by an academic vice chair from industry and hosted by the free and open source Silicon Foundation. So there's a sustaining body. Okay. Plan in progress to release the first full version next month and help. Please help us. Okay. It's a standard way. Right? We have the monthly calls, we have a mailing list, we, we have pull requests. If we've got something wrong, and there is one egregious error in one of the scripts where I get my calculation of relative values upside down, um, um, please send in the pull requests and help us fix it. Okay. Thank you. There's where you can find all about it. Any more questions? It's more of an observation than anything. As, as with all benchmarks, it seems like it's more likely to be useful to the people building chips, instruction sets, compilers, than it is to me, somebody who's trying to choose a platform to use in my end product. I think this is where, this is why I have nervousness about the single score, because you know, decided I'm going to invest my 10 million pound funding my new wonderful product on the basis of one number. And certainly my professional experience is you can benchmark with standard benchmark suites. They're useful, they're indicative, they're helpful, they give you insight, but that's what they give you. They don't give you a magic answer. And we've certainly had cases of customers who've given us a set of standard benchmarks saying, optimize your compiler for this. And we deliver the compiler and it says it's rubbish on our real program. Well, your benchmarks don't represent your real program. Give us your real program and we'll tune it for that. Um, so I think, and that's the same with you know, processor designers, library designers, you know, there's a big piece of work which we're also involved in, which is to improve the libraries. Which of those libraries do you want to improve so that they're good? Because you do have to use libraries in the real world, particularly the emulation libraries. 
Uh, but it's, a, it's an absolutely fair observation, and I will always say, use it as a tool in your toolbox. It's not the whole toolbox. Richard? A tiny detail, which I might just have missed when you said it. The slide showing the evolution of the compiler from release, release to release. What was the 1.0 baseline in that one? Yes. The so the answer is the 1.0 is somewhere. It was it was 9.2 and a bit. And so 1.0 I did actually actually about the time 9.1 came out but using the upstream code base, which had a few more optimizations in. So it's relative to that release. Yeah, yeah it's, it's sort of, it's sort of, no, no. one of the good questions is, this is not a RISC-V project. The baseline is RISC-V because we had to start somewhere and we started out the RISC-V community. Actually, what we're working on is when we go public, the baseline will change. This is work in progress. All these figures will become irrelevant because the baseline will be based on an integer version of the on Cortex M4. And the reason for that is the baseline should be something that is ubiquitous. And much as we'd like to believe it, ARM is otherwise, ARM is much more ubiquitous than RISC V. We think taking something where you can go get a $5 board and run this and repeat it yourself on something that's widely available is much more credible. So ARM will become the baseline, ARM Cortex M4 will become the baseline at this stage. What becomes the baseline in two years' time when we do the next release? Who knows? But um, ARM Cortex M4 seems the appropriate baseline for MBench IoT. It's actually going, the first version is going to become be version 0.5, because even though it's a released version, we're not <coughs> confident enough yet that we've shaken up enough for it to be 1.0. So the second version will probably be 1.0. Any more? Any more for any more? What happened to ARM in 8.3? They, they kind of squeeze the deviation and then it pops out again. They have a regression or something. Well, so where's this on the... In 8.3, the, the standard deviation in the ARM just kind of decreased. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, what I would say is don't get too hung up on that. I'm only recording it to two significant figures. And I suspect that's between 1.10 and 1.09. And who knows where the boundary was that I mean, you can read to that. I mean, if this was suddenly shot down here, yes, it would be interesting. I think that's probably just the, the digit. Okay. Anything else? Okay. okay. I thank you all very much. Thank you.